Great, thank you, Brooke. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, we'll talk about what we're gonna do today. So <clears throat> good, good luck for everyone here. We're gonna tag team a little bit today. This was a really hard act to follow. It's inauguration day. Uh, some of you probably were watching the inauguration. I know I was. So here's how we're gonna do it. I'm going to do Amazing Grace and Steve is going to read poetry. Um, sure. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> we're we're gonna do our, you know, what we do best from our respective subject matter areas. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of handle some of the policy stuff and Steve is gonna handle care delivery, industry trends and technology. This is what we're gonna to cover today. Um, the Biden administration is coming in, just came in right now. So um, top of mind, what is the Biden administration gonna do? What are their first priorities gonna be? So we decided that I'm gonna go first and uh, address some of those issues. And then we're gonna kind of get into the rest of the year, um, talk about where care delivery is going, healthcare technology and some other things. So um, next slide, please. I think we're gonna start with a poll. So. Um, Will the Affordable Care Act, um, Brooke, is this something that I should read? Yeah, you can, uh, you okay. can read it or I can read it. I'll... Will the Affordable Care Act, ACA, be repealed? The big elephant in the room. Um, bring, bring in it back to, to the ACA. It's a good, good way to start. Yes in full, yes partially, maybe or no. And I just launched that poll, so if everyone can just put in your answers really quickly. Looks like we're getting some good votes coming in. Give you a couple more seconds. And votes are leveling off. And we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. OK, cool. Um, do those results again. OK, so maybe yes, partially, and no. OK, 53% no, 25% uh, yes, partially, so 45% yes, maybe, and 53% no. So that's that's interesting. And I think it kind of um, reflects, uh, um, you know, what's been going on in the media covering this, what's been going on, um, you know, in, in with the Senate and the House. Um, so I think everyone is starting to absorb this. If we could go to the next slide, please, um, Brooke. Um, the ACA seems to be in less peril than it was a few months ago. Um, you know, to boil things down here, my view is that um, I, I think it is not going to be repealed. And um, it, it comes down to the constitutionality of the individual mandate under the California versus Texas case. And it hinges on that. It was looking for a while, you know, a little bit questionable. And I think also media tends to oversimplify. It looks like it's going to the Supreme Court, the Supremes are gonna decide, and then it's gonna stand, or the, the entire law is gonna stand or it's gonna fall. There's actually a lot of procedural stuff involved in there. It's coming up from an appeals court. The issue of severability from the rest of the ACA, the mandate from the rest of the ACA was decided in the federal district court. So even if the Supreme Court affirms the appeals court, it's gonna go down to the district, federal district court to re, uh, rehear that issue of severability. It looked in November when the Supreme Court was hearing this in oral argument that uh, they tend, even the new justices seemed inclined to, um, to respect the doctrine of, of severability. That's, so that's one thing that's happened. Um, which kind of makes it less likely it's going to be completely repealed. The other thing is the the Georgia runoff and the new split 50-50, um, you know, very slim Democratic majority in the Senate. Um, so it, it looks even more possible now that a technical fix could come in in Congress. So even if um, it is um, not severed, the mandate could be amended to to be a nominal penalty, which would make it constitutional because it was done under the taxing power and so forth. If you go back and, and read the original uh, Supreme Court decision on that. So, so it looks like uh, it's, it's a, less, a lot less likely that a lot of it is gonna be um, repealed. It's probably, I think it's probably not gonna be repealed at all. It's going to stand. There's a lot of popular programs in the ACA um, including, you know, the, the consumer-focused ones, uh, 
protection for individuals with pre-existing conditions, coverage for children up to age 26, the exchanges, um, greater access and availability of health insurance, the obvious stuff, but kind of more on topic for us, the last bullet here, you know, these are, are popular programs in the healthcare industry, value-based care, the you know, Medicare Shared Savings Program. Those are things also that the administration and Congress and probably you know, has bipartisan support to continue those programs. So, so I think um, those are, are likely to continue whatever happens to the ACA. Um, next slide, please. So individual mandate, um, I think I, I addressed that. Congress could take action to, to restore it. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what other changes are possible within the framework of the ACA? Increased resources for demonstration projects um, and increasing tax credits and subsidies to purchase insurance on the exchanges. So those are probably some of the big ones that can be done within the existing law don't, that don't require new policy. And I'm going to get into a little bit about, you know, what policy can change given democratic control of the Senate and the House. Next slide, please. Okay, the Biden administration is coming in. Healthcare team is coming in. We've seen a lot of appointments. Um, some of these are going to be confirmed in the Senate. Some of them don't need to be confirmed in the Senate. Um, that are, you know, whether or not cabinet level or otherwise require confirmation. Uh, Javier Becerra, uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. Jeffrey Zentz, these are probably, you know, Vivek Murthy is Sur Surgeon General. Jeffrey Zentz leading the um, COVID-19 charge. These are probably some of the, the big ones here on this slide. And I think the, the thing to point out here is you look through these appointments, one of the stories is huge emphasis on COVID-19 recovery, vaccine distribution and coordination. Zentz uh, is a turnaround artist. Um, it's been in both the private and the public sector. Uh, he's known for turning around the healthcare.gov debacle uh, back in the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And um, it, people have a lot of confidence in him leading the charge and being able to negotiate uh, across bureaucracies to get things done, get vaccine distribution done. So that's Zents. Um, next, uh, and some of, some of these topics. Next slide. Uh, Cyrus, a small typo here, it's, it's S for Shapar, um, COVID-19 data director. Uh, I think the story on some of these appointments, you see Fauci remains, is, is data is important. Um, and uh, you, you have a, a COVID-19 uh, data director. Um, data and reporting is going to be emphasized by this administration. Some of the folks are, you know, are going to remain for a little while, like Perna. Uh, Fauci is going to remain, uh, you know, long term, looks like in the Biden administration. Next slide, please. So, Rochelle Walensky, um, CDC. Um, another new thing, new emphasis in the Biden administration equity and uh, addressing equities and disparities in healthcare. So, with Marcella Munez Smith as the first equity task force chair for COVID-19. We're gonna see some emphasis on that in the Biden administration as well. Um, and announcement from yesterday, Andrea Palm, Deputy Secretary HHS. So she will be kind of doing a lot of the day-to-day -day kind of chief operating officer HHS. Next slide. And then the Senate. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you were following the Georgia runoff. So um, there, there's, you know, it's a very slim majority, but one of the big consequences is of democratic control, even though it's only 50-50 and Kamala Harris has the swing vote as VP, it's still considered democratic control. Democrats chair the committee. So the important committees of jurisdiction, as we call them in healthcare in the Senate, are health, education, labor, and pensions. And Senator Patty Murray is coming in to chair that, um, uh, Washington senator. And she has been known to advocate for a stronger federal response on COVID-19. Senator Ron Wyden, Oregon, leading the Finance Committee, very powerful committee in healthcare in the Senate. And he has push, pushed for drug pricing reform and, and drug price negotiation. Next uh, slide, please. So 
what are the top priorities of the Biden administration? COVID, 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 you know, all the time for the foreseeable future. So if we're thinking about like, what are the other healthcare priorities? The first question you want to ask is, is it related to COVID? Because the first six months, it's most likely going to be like mostly COVID. Um, vaccine distribution, in, in, um, getting the vaccine out, coordinating that. Um, you see from some of the leaders there, there's going to be a massive federal effort, a federal plan, federal coordination on, on vaccine, but also testing, expansion of testing, contact tracing, and so forth, and reporting, uh, better public health reporting or addressing some of the deficiencies there, um, getting the reporting up for, from states and localities on, you know, into the CDC um, and other agencies on a national basis. Um, then expansion for funding of, uh, you know, once we once we get through that expansion for funding of ACA programs, like including value-based care and expansion of coverage. Um, so let me pause for a moment here to talk about uh, the 50-50 split, budget reconciliation versus supermajority. So a lot of the policy issues can only get through the Senate, will only be able to get through under the Senate rules we expect to be adopted by McConnell Schumer in the coming days. Um, if there is, you know, the, traditionally a 60 uh, vote supermajority. Um, so that's going to be tough because you got to get 10 Republicans to go along with, the, with Democrats on policy issues. Um, and if you lose Democrats, include, you know, if you lose some of the further left wing of the party, you got to get more Republicans. Um, so you can see how that's tough. Budget reconciliation is a process that only requires a... Um, a bare majority. So you get 50 and um, tie-breaking vote, Kamala Harris, you can get things done under budget reconciliation. However, that only can happen a couple of times during the year, generally speaking, when, when the budget is up for approval. So the types of things that we you know think can happen through budget reconciliation, um, uh, Medicare drug price negotiation actually could uh, could happen through bu budget reconciliation. As a reminder, some of the ACA was done in 20, 2010 through the budget reconciliation project process. When financial items are are a part of it, when it, you know when it's when it's related to the budget, it can be it can be pulled into that process. Um, some of the ACA expansions, uh, increased subsidies, um, tax credits could be done through budget reconciliation. So some health policy can come in that way, um, but other larger, uh, bigger picture health policy issues um, might be tougher. Next slide, please. For example, public option, Medicare for all, lowering the, lowering the Medicare eligibility age to 60. Those are um, often considered pure policy and less related to budgetary items, although some, you know, these are, these are more pure policy. Some are more of a hybrid. It's going to be hard to see movement in this Congress, um, given the split, the bear split, on some of these issues. So um, we're expecting some more incremental uh, changes, uh, as uh, I was outlining before, and some things coming through budget reconciliation. Next slide, please. So. Biden, the Biden administration recently released, and you might have seen the speech uh, last week on the COVID-19 plan, recently released some details of the, uh, the recovery plan that's going to be going to, you know, proposed to the Congress. It's a $1.9 trillion plan. Uh, we fully expect this is going to be negotiated, as we've seen, you know, there, there was just a 900 plus billion dollar plan in December. So it is probably not going to be that big when it occurs, but I, I just want to point out some notable features of the national COVID-19 plan. Um, so the do dollars are going to change, um, details of this are going to change, but this is what the administration is proposing. So on this first slide here, um, uh, going down on the left column, bottom bullet funding, 100,000 public health workers to assist in vaccine distribution. This illustrates the kind of effort that, that the administration um, is looking for, to put, putting forward for the vaccine distribution, reporting and tracing, um, tracking folks who need a second dose, who, who are they uh, and, and have they had it and so forth. 
And then the idea is that this workforce is going to transition into peacetime, so to speak, or post-COVID time into a public health workforce that can um, deal with other public health emergencies and expand the capacity of our national public health system. So that it's part of the vision there. Next column on the top right, the, um, the equitable distribution of test treatments and vaccines, addressing disparities in distribution of vaccines and supplies. Uh, supplies. This is going to be a big theme um, in expanding services and, and availability of vaccine for underserved populations. So this is kind of a departure from the prior administration, something we're going to see a lot of. Next slide, please. So just a, you know, a, a few further elements of the COVID-19 plan, um, increased emphasis on public health surveillance. Um, that, that goes into you know, both technology and policy issues we're going to talk a little bit more about today. Um, support for local, tribal um, uh, governments, and um, you know that that's kind of new, and um, a lot of dollars for first responders and essential workers. So um, I, I would expect that number to change to 350 billion dollars. That's certainly going to be subject to some negotiation, um, and then um, preserving and expanding healthcare coverage. And with that, I'm going to hand it to uh, Steve for the poetry segment. Um, okay, care delivery. We're going to take a look now at how care delivery has been impacted and will continue to be impacted um, in 2021. Uh, Brooke, can we go to the next slide? I just want to start off with the toll COVID has uh, 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 placed, uh, get, placed on us and the whole world. Um, these numbers were pulled from the, the uh, Washington Post last Thursday. And as you could expect, they've changed dramatically since then. We're now hit the 2 million mark uh, of deaths worldwide. And we broke 400,000 uh, nationally in the United States. Uh, closing in on 100 million cases uh, and uh, across the world with close to 25% happening in the United States with uh, about 24 million total cases being reported. Um, so this is something uh, that's tremendous impact on us all. And I remember as a little boy, my grandmother was 16 during the uh, Spanish flu in 1918. And every Thanksgiving, there was a conversation about the flu and how tough it was. I'm sure that we will have conversations with our grandchildren long into the future on this one. Next slide. Um, this also is the United States, uh, uh, cumulative cases and deaths. If you look at the top slide, that's the rolling number of cases, cumulative, as well as daily counts. We're close to 300,000 new cases a day. And on, on the bottom slide, um, we're at close to 4,000 uh, deaths per day. Um, and you can see in this slide, we had that big surge in the spring, mostly centered around New York and California. Then we, we leveled out as uh, 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 social distancing brought down the ra infection rates and the death rates. Uh, then a slur surge in the summer and then uh, taking off right around election time uh, in November. So next slide. Uh, this slide is, 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 is useful. The bottom line here is what you'd expect the death rate to be in any given year in the United States. And the actual observed numbers of deaths well above that line. And again, this stops in October, just before the, the current surge of both deaths and uh, cases that we're experiencing. Uh, so again, the burden on the health system, the burden on our on our people has been tremendous. Um, as we move on to the next slide, um, and, and I, I really want to call out the, the, the tremendous burden this has had on our healthcare workforce. Uh, your colleagues, our colleagues, uh, have uh, experienced tremendous physical and 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 
mental health impacts uh, during the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, in particular, um, there's um, uh, those working in high-risk departments, emergency departments, ICUs uh, are impacted. Those with inadequate or suboptimal uh, hand hygiene or access uh, to proper PPE um, and, and unprotected exposure and those working with long hours with infected patients uh, have been infected the most uh, and, and, and have, have um, and that's where the highest mortality has been. Um, put on, on the slide a uh, a site lost on the front line, which is a, a memorial to uh, fallen healthcare workers. And again, um, this is going to last uh, and impact our industry for for forever. Uh, next slide. Um, you know the uh, the CDC has launched a new initiative within a, the last two months, and it's a focus on both our communities as well as our healthcare frontline workers. It's called uh, Project First Line, and it's a uh, opportunity. Uh, CDC is providing focus on infection prevention, infection control, both within the hospital and within our communities. This is co-sponsored with the Health Research and Education Trust, uh, American Medical Association, American Nurses Association, and it gives some practical tools and resources to implement infection control protocols in every patient interaction. So this might be a site that you want to look at uh, for resources uh, for your own, own, own hospital and healthcare settings. Next slide. So the uh, talked about how we've responded to um, the tremendous change in the delivery system with uh, influx of COVID patients. It's had unanticipated consequences. Um, if you look at this slide, cancer screening for breast cancer, colon cancer, and cervical cancer have dropped between 86 and 94 percent during the pandemic. This will have a long-term impact on, uh, on, 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 on healthcare uh, as uh, early, early detection is, is impacted by uh, the, the decision by people to forego uh, interaction with the healthcare system uh, because of their fear and risk of being infected. So this is one big change that's uh, in, impacted uh, healthcare. Um, the next slide. Financial impact. Uh, probably all of you on this phone call, on this webinar are aware of the financial impact this has had on your institutions, uh, whether in an ambulatory setting or, or, or a hospital setting. Um, operating margins, uh, have fallen dramatically nationwide, a 5% drop in margins. Now the CARES Act helped provide some support to the health healthcare delivery system, but that's still only offset uh, uh, two, uh, 3% of that losses down to negative 2%. Discharges, volumes are down um, in terms of, of elective discharges, OR minutes, elective procedures are down, ED visits are down in general, um, uh, and this is through November. Of course, now we have uh, ICU, uh, our ICUs are at capacity in, in many states and regions, um, and of course, revenues are, are, are dramatically down, 14% per adjusted discharge. Outpatient revenue, where we do expect to lose much of the, the uh, elective work. Outpatient revenue is down 6% compared to inpatient revenue is down 1%. So the financial impact is, is striking. We can see this uh, spread out over time on the next slide, uh, where you can see uh, operating margin month by month, 
uh, and the big drop uh, beginning in with, with the pandemic in March and the slight offset, uh, uh, the offset uh, after you factor in the impact of, of the CARES Act, which helped hospitals survive financially uh, during this period. Uh, so again, uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous financial impact. Um, and of course, it's impacted you in other ways. Um, one of the things we've experienced is that many uh, people who devote their, their time towards process improvement in, in uh, care settings are actually doing frontline work right now. Uh, and uh, the, the, and that reflects financial impact and the shortage of, uh, of staff due to, uh, due to uh, COVID. Can we move to the next slide? So this is the so-called light at the end of the tunnel slide. So this was again, last week I pulled these for this uh, presentation, 11 million vaccinations through uh, January 14th. In the six days since then, there's been an additional 5 million. So we're approaching about 1 million vaccinations a day, uh, which, uh, Dr. Fochi predicted uh, in the first week of January that we would be at 1 million a day uh, uh, before the end of this month. And the, the pace is starting to pick up, but we're still struggling getting uh, vaccinations in place. And some areas are hit very hard. Um, I was actually just out on um, um, all, the, all the websites. Uh, this Ohio, I live in Ohio. They announced that uh, Phase 1B, which is going to be 65 and older, and and or uh, uh, individuals with high risk chronic diseases, would be eligible to to get vaccines beginning yesterday. That's been pushed back till next week. I was up at midnight seeing if I could get my vaccination. I happen to have one of those chronic diseases that would make me eligible. Um, but again, there's a shortage of supplies here in Ohio. So we're all struggling with the rapidity of, at which we can get this vaccine into people's arms. Um, but progress will be made. Um, next slide. Now there is a challenge uh, with the vaccine distribution in that there's hesitation on some, uh, some Americans. Uh, based on political orientation, based on ethnicity, based on age, urban, rural. Um, and uh, so it's, a, it's just an interesting trend to see who's most eager to get vaccinated. People over 65, urban residents, people with someone who's sick in their house, uh, Democrats, people in their 50s, uh, are most likely Hispanics. Women are more likely than men. Uh, and then, and healthcare workers, are surprisingly, are, are a little cautious. Up at 29% are hesitant. Um, but if we move to the next slide, um, minds do change and they can change rapidly. This is a, a slide, as you can see, those who definitely or probably will not get the vaccine, those rates are dropping in almost, almost all categories. Uh, and the, the total uh, number of people decline, who say they won't get the vaccine has dropped from 34 to 27%. And again, it is driven somewhat by political uh, uh, orientation. Um, and then one more slide, the next slide, please. And then finally, uh, I think this is important. The key role of the primary care physician, the family physician, in being a source of information about the COVID vaccine. I know in some of our, our rural states, there's a lot of, uh, of attempts to actually um, mobilize the primary care physician to uh, speak up the, the uh, vaccine and encourage their, their, their patients to uh, 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 their patients to get vaccinated because of the fears and concerns about the vaccine. Again, those fears seem to be mitigating as more and more people get vaccinated. Um, 
Dan, I'm going to hand it back to you for the next slide, which talks about policy changes related to the delivery system. Yeah, so I think the segue here is looking at the issues we have with vaccine distribution, reporting, contact tracing. Shouldn't we be in a better place, you know, having had 10 months of uh, notice that we need to be distributing this vaccine? Um, and, you know, we thought maybe even longer, but there, there's been some time and um, we, we can see that, that there are some problems. So going back to the policy lens again, what are some of the lessons learned? What do we think the administration might do about it? And what could happen kind of on a bar bipartisan basis in the future to address some of these issues? So I'm um, just going to take a little bit of time to discuss that. So as noted, the immediate focus of the Biden administration is going to be COVID-19 and vaccine distribution. But uh, as part of that, uh, I mentioned data collection. Uh, data collection, uh, uh, expanded use of data is going to be uh, important. And uh, maybe we should have been doing some more of that if we'd had the infrastructure and the capability all along, that would have been great. But um, you know, we're, we're seeing some funding to states and localities for you know their public health response infrastructure in the new plan. We, um, there's been a little bit in some in the CARES Act and some of the other other plans, but I think a lot of people agree it's still pretty broken. There's a lot of paper reporting, kind of mismatched data coming up. So I think we're going to see um, over the next year. This is a, probably a little bit longer term and emphasis on on better reporting and data infrastructure. Um, and then data use is about, do our current laws and regulations give us the use rights to be able to, to do the things in a public health emergency we need to do with the data, you know, research on effective treatments and diagnostic techniques and, um, and, and just um, being able to push information out, sharing information securely. So I think we're, we're going to see some emphasis on that. And, um, you know, I, I think personally regulation is stuck and we pushed on it a little bit as a company during this emergency. We're trying to get expanded, um, you know, discretionary enforcement from the Office of Civil Rights to use use data, de-identified um, data, in some cases um, aggregated PHI for um, for retrospective analysis on effectiveness and, and so forth of, of treatments. Um, and uh, there, there were some leeway given, but the regulation is kind of stuck uh, where it was. Um, but the technology has moved ahead. So we have platforms of just, you know, looking at what they're doing in California now, talking about um, using a privacy agent, which is a virtual kind of uh, one stop shopping to ha have patients indicate what their privacy preferences are across the healthcare continuum. That kind of stuff is possible now, and regulation is really slow. If you look at the last HIPAA proposed rule, it's doing incremental stuff. It's not doing the big stuff. And I'm hoping that we see some of this, this bigger picture thinking in the next uh, year or two on data use. Next slide, please. Um, you know, so uh, other things, uh, problems, lessons learned, uh, patient matching. How do you do contact tracing? How do you get back to patients to remind them of the second dose and so forth. If you don't know who it is, if you have, you know, a thousand people with, with the same last, you know, first and last name in a health system um, and, uh, you know, other issues and just, there's disparity issues in terms of um, identifying patients. So uh, some kind of national patient matching strategy, whether it's a national patient identifier or something else. Again, the technology is there the political will isn't necessarily there. There's a section in the 510 of the Appropriations Act, the House passed it to explore, it's been blocked since 1998, as part of HIPAA to come up with a national strategy for patient matching. Um, appropriations to study that have been blocked for 22 years. Um, that was unblocked by the House. We're looking at um, uh, the possibility of unblocking that in the Senate now. And it's probably a little more possible with the Senate configuration. So I'm looking for possibility of movement there on national patient matching, which would be a um, huge step forward, game changer. Interoperability. Wow. Um, when do we need interoperability and in, in the anti-information blocking rule? 
It was last March and before that, as this pandemic was emerging, um, that was the same time that the, the rule came out, but then was delayed. I'm still scratching my head on that. So, um, you know, we've had notice since before the 21st Century Cures Act in 2016 that this was coming. Why weren't we prepared to do that? The technology is there. Technology companies, including Health Catalyst, are there. Um, why won't the industry move? I think it's going to move. The rule is going to come into effect. Why wow, you really need to be patient in healthcare and healthcare policy. Um, but I think changes are, are going to come there. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, policy changes, uh, you know, uh, um, related to national public health response infrastructure. So some of the, the problems we've seen at Health Catalyst and, and I think have been seen across the industry, vocabularies. I'm starting with the bottom, bottom up vocabulary standards, EHR, pharmacy, lab data. The mappings are still very difficult. It's, um, you know, and it, it's great that we have the movement um, and the requirements to establish APIs and share information through fire and, and so forth. But um, until we get the vocabulary, um, problems sorted out, it's still going to be difficult to map and understand the data coming in. So we need to do a better job of that and some of these other things, you know, national data aggregation and reporting system, um, uh, expand, expansion of uh, PCORI, PCORnet. I, I think that these things are going to happen um, maybe, you know, kind of uh, following on or following from the efforts on the COVID-19 um, all-out push uh, in the first six months of this year. Um, but then um, as we looked at, look and reflect on what happened and think about another emergency, these things are going to come uh, forward in the policy discussion. That's, um, let's move to the next slide and I think a poll. Mm -hmm. Steve? Okay, so I, I'll read this one. Uh, in your opinion, what will be the top healthcare story in 2021? Your first choice is COVID, your second choice is COVID, your third choice is COVID, your fourth choice is COVID, and your fifth choice is cosmetic surgery. All right. Which COVID people put down? <laughs> um, Let's share the result. <laughs> there we go. This tells you something about choice architecture. They went for the first COVID. <laughs> COVID to get. Uh, and and um, we thought we needed a little comic relief after a, what has been a somewhat somber discussion of COVID and uh, and I know we uh, we're all experiencing that, and a little laughter is good. Uh, let's move on to our healthcare technology section, where it's headed and the next big thing. And this is actually um, uh, um, a good news story in many ways. So let's go to the next slide. Um, the, yeah. So I'm just going to chime in here for a second. So, you know, leveraging data to improve research into effective diagnostic diagnosis and treatment and assist with vaccine distribution and tracking some of the highest and best use of data. Um, we're a data analytics company, so we think about this a lot at Health Catalyst. But um, this is a quote from The Economist. And I, I read The Economist. And one of the things I like about it is it takes you out of the um, the kind of echo chamber of the United States 24 hour news cycle and sheds a little bit of perspective. Like we're only 4% of the world population in the United States. Sometimes we think we, you know, we're 40 or 80%, I think, you know, when we're here. But these are the same issues that we're facing. And then that this was interesting to me, individual control of um, records and patient matching, um, need for data analytics, um, the, the need to address uh, some of these infrastructure issues uh, and, and do, do, do better and utilize analytics and artificial intelligence effectively are issues that every health system in the world is dealing with. This is an example from, from India creating a, a national health ID. So I just wanted to kind of, this is just a little intro into some of the discussion of emerging technology trends. Steve? Yes. Next slide, please. So. Uh, COVID has accelerated some changes uh, quite dramatically 
and has also demonstrated how nimble we can be uh, as an industry. Uh, give you some examples, uh, drug development, the vaccine development, that was uh, a remarkable uh, journey. Uh, you know, when this started, we were talking about multiple years before a vaccine could be developed. And yet, yet uh, um, vaccines are now being injected into people's arms uh, so as quickly as that. Data analytics and artificial intelligence have uh, um, uh, expanded dramatically in ways that could not have been predicted a year ago. Uh, things like patient uh, decision tools and telemedicine have expanded. I'm going to go into some more details. Uh, COVID really made the need to leverage data and advanced analytics uh, central to many health systems. Uh, expansion of, of, of that, those capabilities um, and the need for real-time data or close to real-time data has been very dramatic. Uh, hospital administrators are looking at their COVID dashboards um, on an hourly basis now, and data is being updated to their business intelligence reporting tools uh, on frequent intervals. Um, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, a year ago, probably the most um, uh, useful applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning were to predict revenue cycle trends uh, and attempts to do things like use our artificial intelligence to read imaging and things like that really didn't take off. Well, now these are being used directly to develop predictive models, to track the virus, to estimate, est estimate risk of COVID-19 patients with severe symptoms so they can be treated uh, more effectively. Um, and uh, uh, health systems are expanding their capabilities to practice precision, precision medicine and predictive analytics. So a big change um, and, uh, uh, and uh, so a big change in the data analytics world. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, another thing we expect is uh, what we call the expanding role of the chief information officer. Um, health, health systems are rapidly expanding support for a digital workforce and, to, and uh, CIOs are playing a larger role in the organization's strategy and risk management. Uh, and they're also playing a larger role in cybersecurity to respond to increases in ransomware attacks threats to incoming email, secure data, uh, and sec securing data storage. Another, another factor, it was actually on the previous slide, um, uh, digital portals, uh, that becomes an important role for the CIO to manage and maintain the digital portal in a safe fashion. Uh, we've seen EHR expand, we can anticipate EHR expansion with uh, digital and voice assistance, uh, a natural language process, um, and uh, we'll see more clinical IT developments, including uh, 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 augmented reality and wearable technology so that patients can make uh, decisions uh, in real time uh, with real data. Next slide. Um, and then the, the, the big, the, one of the biggest is telehealth is here to stay. Um, COVID-19 created an urgent need for telehealth. Uh, according to a McKinsey study, the number of patients using telehealth increased from 11% to 46% in the past year. And we anticipate this to continue to grow. Uh, and there's an expectation that telehealth could, in the very near future, amount for 20% or $250 billion of all healthcare spending. Um, and telehealth still needs greater integration with existing technology platforms, and it does present a cyber security and privacy concern. So again, going back to that CIO's, CIO's larger role to play. Got some data on telehealth and on the next slide. Oops. 
This will give you a sense of the rapid growth of telehealth during the COVID crisis. And that, that timeline goes from uh, a baseline period of the previous year to uh, from March through September of this year. Uh, and telehealth helped uh, offset the loss of uh, office visits. Um, and I actually, another good poll question would have been how many people have had a telehealth visit this year? Uh, it's it's a it's a common. Um, my primary care physician is really responsive to to uh, email questions and so on. It's just a tremendous change that I can, I can have witnessed personally. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, talking about policy changes, uh, I think this was a, a success story in telehealth in 2020, um, where the growth in the private sector, um, the increased availability to patients, patients' increased use of telehealth coincided with policy enablers from the public sector to encourage and enable the expansion of telehealth. So some of the things that happened from uh, the policy side are equalized reimbursement for telehealth services. Some of these, by the way, are temporary and some of them have already made their way into permanent policy changes, both um, you know, in Medicare and Medicaid and um, also with some payers. Um, other things include practicing, allowing clinicians to practice across state lines to enable telehealth visits um, and allowing both established and new patient telehealth visits, allowing audio devices only. Um, so some of these are, you know, being considered or characterized as flexi flexibilities or looseners, um, temporary loosening inter inter interstate licensure requir requirements. Um, and so if you go down to the second to last bullet, the 2021 Medicare physician fee schedule expanded and made some of the some of this permanent reimbursement for some telehealth services, remote monitoring um, services, although some of it remains temporary and hasn't made its way into permanent policy changes, although I would expect that's going to continue to happen. Um, also, the call out to the commercial payer sector. So if you, you look through what uh, a lot of the big and small payers have done to enable tele telehealth, waiving co-pays, expanding coverage uh, in many of the same ways as the public sector. Next, uh, next slide, please. So what's next? Um, or, yeah, one back, there we go. Um, I, I think the Biden administration is going to continue the policies to promote telehealth, including reimbursement parity, access enablers, um, continued expansion of, of reimbursement changes to enable and accommodate telehealth. Uh, habits have changed. So uh, there's, a, there, there's a real reality there. Um, it, it's um, the pandemic and the, uh, you know, what happened in telehealth um, has accelerated the change, um, probably multiple years. And a lot of folks aren't gonna go back, patients and providers. So that is going to continue to um, result in expansion and parity of telehealth over the coming years with in-person. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that it can address uh, availability in rural areas, underserved communities, address some disparity issues um, it, more easily. Um, there's a lot of stuff that the physical world uh, puts in place that, um, that creates challenges in all of those areas that telehealth can help with. So I think we'll see policies addressed at that as well, um, leveraging telehealth. Next slide. And I think we've got a poll. All right. Yes. So we're um, nearing the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions for Stephen or Dan, now would be a great time to submit those um, into the control panel. And we'll start our Q&A session in just a minute. We are going to launch our final poll. Um, let's go ahead with this. All right, so while today's webinar was focused on 2021 healthcare trends, um, some of you may want to learn more about Health Catalyst products and professional services. So if you'd like to learn more, please answer this poll question. And I'll go ahead and leave that open for a few minutes while we jump into our questions.
Okay. Our first question says, isn't the ONC address initiative meant to be a national patient matching strategy? Yeah, I think I, I should probably take this one. Um, so what, what, what does it say? Which initiative? It, it says, isn't the ONC um, address initiative meant to be a yeah. national patient so, matching strategy? So, um, yeah, the ONC has done a lot. Um, and uh, I didn't mean to imply that the government hasn't done anything on this uh, under Dr. Rucker and uh, company. The ONC has attended to this issue, both as required under the 21st Century Cures Act and because it's the right thing to do and part of the ONC's mission. Um, and they've developed a lot of good material and information. What we haven't seen yet is a clear national strategy for how patient matching is going to work. Um, there are some frameworks um, that have been proposed. There's, there's, a, you know, there's, there's, um, uh, but they haven't really been implemented. That funding to study it um, hasn't been unblocked, and Congress hasn't hasn't passed a strategy. So that's what we're. Those are the changes we're looking for. But there's been a lot of good work done. Great. Okay. Next question. Um, they said, please explain the COVID vaccine passport ID digital or stamp. Um, Steve, do you want to address that? Or I, uh, I have some, yeah. I, I, I don't know much about that. Um, I just know you want to get one. So when you get your, when you get your first injection, um, you, uh, you're going to get a, a, a um, uh, identification that you're proof of the vaccination. I do not know if it's going to be digital or just a, a paper document with a stamp. Yeah, I, I agree. So there's some of the larger technology companies are coming forward with um, with services that will provide a, a digital or electronic um, stamp to as, as proof or certification that you've gotten the vaccine. And I think um, we're not sure what the uptake of that technology is going to be or what the policy support. You know, here you see the interplay between technology and policy again. But I think it's going to get a tremendous amount of attention over the next couple of months, um, especially as different sectors of the economy kind of spark back to life. And to do so, they're going to need to, to prove or demonstrate or require um, uh, individuals have been vaccinated to travel, to go to work. Department of Labor has come out with something about, you know, uh, you know, uh, empowering private employers to, to require vaccination and so forth. We're going to see more and more of that. And I think these technologies, we didn't see a lot of uptake on the contact tracing technology from the big techs, but I think on the passport, we're going to see more uptake because a solution is, is really going to be required. Perfect. Okay, next question. Do you think that full risk or downside risk value-based care models will accelerate in 2021? We kind of went back and forth about this, and we're leaning towards the status quo is going to be maintained. We don't expect traumatic changes, uh, either positive or negative. That um, uh, we just don't see a lot of activity on ramping up and making uh, uh, greater greater downside risk a, a factor right now, particularly given the financial situations. Um, and the anomaly of a year where risk would be, risk was driven by COVID more than anything. Um, hard to maintain population health during a pandemic and reduce costs per case. Dan, any other comments? I, I would concur with that. Yeah, I think the, the, in my view, this is one of the things that, um, will become a, a policy emphasis a little further down the road once the um, the immediate needs of uh, the pandemic are are addressed. Um, and uh, not sure, I, I don't see the current policy environment um, necessarily influencing that one way or the other right now. Okay, next question. Do you think there will be a rush to acquire payers, i.e. provider-centric networks acquiring payers? Your payers. 
Was that pay, did you say was that provider centric network networks acquiring payers? Yes. Mm -hmm. Steve, I, I have a few thoughts on that, but I, I I've got thoughts in that providers um, have not had a, with few exceptions, have not had a good track record in this area. I don't I don't know of any large health systems that seem to be moving in that direction. Am I missing something? Yeah. Um, it's one of these things which other prognosticators for 2021, I think, have pointed out kind of the, the convergence of payers and providers. And, you know, will we see, you know, we've seen, you know, kind of this, uh, um, you know, uh, waxing and waning of provider risk bearing over the years, over many decades. Um, some people see that coming back because it makes sense, you know, and, and it, it may be one of these things that em, empowered by more data, um, it, it like, uh, or empowered by technology like telehealth, it's finally going to come in and work. So, you know, you, I think we're seeing the emergence of, of combined payer providers. Um, I, I'm not going to predict that one. <laughs> I, I will leave it to others to prognosticate on that, but it is a, it is a trend that's been spotted and, um, and some of them have been successful. So I think it'll, it may continue. Okay, next question. Since many of the insurance companies have saved money this year due to a decrease in claims, will there be any collaboration with the federal government to offset the debt created by the funding of the CARES Act? That sounds to me like, are we gonna go back to um, payers and ask them to fund um, the debt. <laughs> um, so there's the world of um, theory uh, and what would probably be a good and fair thing um, and political, then on the other hand, political feasibility. Um, so that, that that's an interesting, to me, that's an interesting concept, you know, I won't say that hasn't, you, you've seen some like auto insurance providers kind of give a dividend to their policyholders, for example. So the theory is, hey, why not ask for a dividend from the payers um, who've saved some money, they're continuing to collect premiums, but haven't paid out as much on claims, um, help with the COVID situation by reducing some of the COVID uh, debt that the government is incurring. Um, politically, um, I think, um, it's going to be tough from from my standpoint, from from a political political standpoint. But um, we'll see what happens uh, um, if if people start um, calling for that. Um, I would think maybe more likely is use of any surplus to in, uh, increase benefits or take other actions that will positively affect patients. Maybe something that um, is more palatable to both the insurers, the payer community, as well as the political community. Great. Uh, next question. Do you see the home health visits to continue to increase post COVID? That's a, a, a great question. Um, I, um, I, I did not do any research on that, so I don't know the answer. Um, I think, um, Home health has been uh, uh, um, probably, I'm, I'm guessing, home health has been put in a bad situation because of COVID and the, the, the reluctance to uh, to uh, uh, have people come into your house, um, and that telemedicine might actually um, absorb some of that that business. But I do, I've not done research on it. Um, yeah, that, I think that's, that's probably a wise response. We want to be data driven and, and focused. Um, the physical world is going to come back. There's a lot of unknowns there. Uh, I, I want to comment on one other thing, which is kind of uh, maybe not home health in person, but remote monitoring and things that are done from home, I think is another thing like telehealth that is with us to stay and is going to continue to expand. I think, uh, you know, data supports that. Um, and the, um, you know, striking a balance of remote uh, patient, you know, patient monitoring and generating data, 
with teleclinician support and in-person support. I think we're going to see new models for that emerging, and those are those are going to stick with us because of, for all the benefits that they provide. Great. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. I'm going to try and get through you know, a couple more questions, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, next question. Are there any peer-reviewed publications, not counting FDA review, you would recommend with regard to the efficiency of COVID vaccines? Um, is there peer-reviewed? Um, uh, I, I just, you just have, you'd have to, I, I, I've just skimmed through, you know, um, things in JAMA and caught, you know, headlines, but I've not, I've not done any research on this. Uh, I think the, um, the efficacy and effectiveness is, is pretty well documented. Um, in the studies, um, and if, and I don't I don't know how good our monitoring will be post uh, with the general population who's being vaccinated right now. Um, that would be the test. I don't know if there's any controlled studies though that would make the peer review literature beyond what's already been done. So I'm not really. Okay, we'll wrap up. This is going to be our last question. I think this is a good one to end on. It says, if we were having this discussion in January of 2022, what would be the most important transformations that health systems should implement to prepare for 2023? I'm going to take a stab at this. I think um, enhancing your data analytics capability is going to be critical. Uh, we, we we didn't really touch on how will we be will will we be prepared for the next pandemic? Data analytics. Uh, if we had the data analytics ten months ago that we have today, we probably would have been a lot better at understanding what was happening uh, with the spread of the vaccine and how to treat it. Um, and again, like like I said, I many of our clients have gone. Um, the the amount of, of, of data that they're managing has doubled over the past year. Uh, the amount of refreshes of the data and the number of people touching uh, dashboards have gone up. And we've got data on that, uh, just at the increased uh, demand for information. Um, so that, um, that will be a striking and permanent change um, and I think that the telehealth is, is going to be the other big permanent change that will significantly transform the look and feel of healthcare delivery. I, I basically agree with that. I might add, um, you know, with the emphasis on preparation, supplies, as well mm -hmm. as capacity planning, but that that's kind of comes out of the data piece. Um, you know, some of the things that I think are going to, you know, improve over the next year and transform um, whatever comes next is going to be different than this pandemic um, but those are some universal things i think that that will hopefully be um, uh, positives and help uh, transformations to help us prepare for the next emergency